This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Green Tea by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. Read by Chris Turtle. Part 2 7. THE JOURNEY FIRST STAGE When the omnibus drove on, and I was alone upon the road, I looked carefully round to ascertain whether the monkey had followed me. To my indescribable relief I saw it nowhere. I can't describe easily what a shock I had received, and my sense of genuine gratitude on finding myself, as I supposed, quite rid of it. I had got out a little before we reached this house, two or three hundred steps. A brick wall runs along the footpath, and inside the wall is a hedge of yew, or some dark garden evergreen of that kind, and within that again the row of fine trees, which you may have remarked as you came. The brick wall is about as high as my shoulder, and happening to raise my eyes I saw the monkey with that stooping gait on all fours, walking or creeping close beside me on top of the wall. I stopped, looking at it with a feeling of loathing and horror. As I stopped, so did it. It sat up on the wall with its long hands on its knees, looking at me. There was not light enough to see it much more than an outline, nor was it dark enough to bring the peculiar light of its eyes into strong relief. I still saw, however, that red, foggy light plainly enough. It did not show its teeth, nor exhibit any sign of irritation, but seemed jaded and sulky, and was observing me steadily. I drew back into the middle of the road. It was an unconscious recoil, and there I stood, still looking at it. It did not move. With an instinctive determination to try something, anything, I turned about and walked briskly towards town with a scant look all the time, watching the movements of the beast. It crept swiftly along the wall, at exactly my pace. Where the wall ends, near the end of the road, it came down, and with a wiry spring or two, brought itself close to my feet, and continued to keep up with me as I quickened my pace. It was at my left side, so close to my leg that I felt every moment as if I should tread upon it. The road was quite deserted and silent, and it was darker every moment. I stopped, dismayed and bewildered, turning as I did so the other way, I mean towards this house, away from which I had been walking. When I stood still, the monkey drew back to a distance of, I suppose, about five or six yards, and remained stationary, watching me. I had been more agitated than I have said. I had read, of course, as everyone has, something about spectral illusions, as you physicians term the phenomena of such cases. I considered my situation, and looked my misfortune in the face. These affections I had read are sometimes transitory, and sometimes obstinate. I had read of cases in which the appearance, at first harmless, had, step by step, degenerated into something direful and insupportable, and ended by wearing its victim out. Still, as I stood there, but for my bestial companion, quite alone, I tried to comfort myself by repeating again and again the assurance, The thing is purely disease, a well-known physical affection, as distinct as smallpox or neuralgia. Doctors are all agreed on that. Philosophy demonstrates it. I must not be a fool. I have been sitting up too late, and I dare say my digestion is quite wrong, and with God's help I shall be all right, and this is but a symptom of nervous dyspepsia. Did I believe all this? Not one word of it. No more than any other miserable being ever did, who is once seized and riveted in this satanic captivity. Against my convictions, I might say my knowledge, I was simply bullying myself into a false courage. I now walked homeward. I had only a few hundred yards to go. I had forced myself into a sort of resignation, but I had not got over the sickening shock and the flurry of the first certainty of my misfortune. I made up my mind to pass the night at home. The brute moved close beside me, and I fancied there was some sort of anxious drawing towards the house, which one sees in tired horses or dogs, sometimes as they come towards home. I was afraid to go into town. I was afraid of anyone seeing and recognising me. I was conscious of an irrepressible agitation in my manner. Also, I was afraid of any violent change in my habits, such as going to a place of amusement, or walking from home in order to fatigue myself. At the hall door it waited till I mounted the steps, and when the door was opened, entered with me. 
I drank no tea that night. I got cigars and some brandy and water. My idea was that I should act upon my material system, and by living for a while in sensation apart from thought, send myself forcibly, as it were, into a new groove. I came up here to this drawing-room. I sat just there. The monkey then got up on a small table, and then stood there. It looked dazed and languid, and irrepressible uneasiness as to its movements kept my eyes always upon it. Its eyes were half closed, but I could see them glow. It was looking steadily at me. In all situations, at all hours, it is awake and looking at me. That never changes. I shall not continue in detail my narrative of this particular night. I shall describe rather the phenomena of the first year, which never varied essentially. I shall describe the monkey as it appeared in daylight. In the dark, as you shall presently hear, there are peculiarities. It is a small monkey, perfectly black. It has only one peculiarity, a character of malignity, unfathomable malignity. During the first year it looked sullen and sick, but this character of intense malice and vigilance was always underlying that surly languor. During all that time it acted as if on a plan of giving me as little trouble as consistent with watching me. Its eyes were never off me. I have never lost sight of it, except in my sleep, light or dark, day or night, since it came here, excepting when it withdraws for some weeks at a time unaccountably. In total dark it is as visible as in daylight. I do not mean merely its eyes. It is as visible distinctly in a halo that resembles a glow of red embers, and which accompanies it in all its movements. When it leaves me for a time, it is always at night, in the dark, and in the same way. It grows at first uneasy, and then furious, and then advances towards me, grinning and shaking, its paws clenched, and at the same time there comes the appearance of fire in the grate. I never have any fire. I can't sleep in the room where there is any. It draws nearer and nearer to the chimney, quivering, it seems, with rage, and when its fury rises to the highest pitch, it springs into the grate and up the chimney, and I see it no more. When first this happened, I thought I was released. I was now a new man. A day passed, a night, and no return. A blessed week, a week, another week. I was always on my knees, Dr. Hesselius, always thanking God and praying. A whole month passed of liberty, but on a sudden it was with me again. 8. The Second Stage It was with me and the malice which before was torpid under a sullen exterior was now active. It was perfectly unchanged in every other respect. This new energy was apparent in its activity and its looks, and soon in other ways. For a time, you will understand, the change was shown only in an increased vivacity, and an air of menace, as if it was always brooding over some atrocious plan. Its eyes, as before, were never off me. "'Is it here now?' I asked. "'No,' he replied. It has been absent exactly a fortnight and a day, fifteen days. It has sometimes been away so long as nearly two months, once for three. Its absence always exceeds a fortnight, although it may be by but a single day. Fifteen days having passed since I saw it last, it may return now at any moment. Is its return, I asked, accompanied by any particular manifestation? Nothing, no, he said. It is simply with me again. On lifting my eyes from a book, or turning my head, I see it as usual, looking at me, and then it remains, as before, for its appointed time. I have never told so much and so minutely before to any one. I perceived that he was agitated, and looking like death, and he repeatedly applied his handkerchief to his forehead. I suggested that he might be tired, and told them that I would call with pleasure in the morning, but he said, "'No, if you don't mind hearing it all now.' I have got so far, and I should prefer making one effort of it. When I spoke to Dr. Harley, I had nothing like so much to tell. You are a philosophic physician. You give spirit its proper rank. If this thing is real, he paused, looking at me with agitated inquiry, we can discuss it by and by, and very fully. I will give you all I think, I answered after an interval. Well, very well. If it is anything real, I say, it is prevailing little by little, and drawing me more interiorly into hell. Optic nerves, he talked of. Ah, oh, well, there are other nerves of communication. May God Almighty help me. You shall hear. 
Its power of action, I tell you, had increased. Its malice became, in a way, aggressive. About two years ago, some questions that were pending between me and the bishop having been settled, I went down to my parish in Warwickshire, anxious to find occupation in my profession. I was not prepared for what happened, although I have since thought I might have apprehended something like it. The reason of my saying so is this. He was beginning to speak with a great deal more effort and reluctance, and sighed often, and it seemed at times nearly overcome. But at this time his manner was not agitated. It was more like that of a sinking patient who has given himself up. Yes, but I will first tell you about Kenlis, my parish. It was with me when I left this place for Dalbridge. It was my silent travelling companion, and it remained with me at the vicarage. When I entered on the discharge of my duties, another change took place. The thing exhibited an atrocious determination to thwart me. It was with me in the church, in the reading desk, in the pulpits, within the communion rails. At last it reached this extremity, that while I was reading to the congregation, it would spring upon the open book and squat there, so that I was unable to see the page. This happened more than once. I left Drawbridge for a time. I placed myself in Dr. Harley's hands. I did everything he told me. He gave my case a great deal of thought. It interested him, I think. He seemed successful. For nearly three months I was perfectly free from a return. I began to think I was safe. With his full assent I returned to Dalbridge. I travelled in a chaise. I was in good spirits. I was more. I was happy and grateful. I was returning, as I thought, delivered from a dreadful hallucination, to the scene of duties which I longed to enter upon. It was a beautiful sunny evening. Everything looked serene and cheerful, and I was delighted. I remember looking out of the window to see the spire of my church at Kenlis among the trees, at the point where one has the earliest view of it. It is exactly where the stream that bounds the parish passes under the road by a culvert, and where it emerges at the roadside, a stone with an old inscription is placed. As we passed this point, I drew my head in and sat down, and in the corner of the chaise was the monkey. For a moment I felt faint, and then quite wild with despair and horror. I called to the driver and got out, and sat down at the roadside, and prayed to God silently for mercy. A despairing resignation supervened. My companion was with me as I re-entered the vicarage. The same persecution followed. After a short struggle I submitted, and soon I left the place. I told you, he said, that the beast has before this become in certain ways aggressive. I will explain a little. It seemed to be actuated by intense and increasing fury whenever I said my prayers, or even meditated prayer. It amounted at last to a dreadful interruption. You will ask how could a silent immaterial phantom affect that? It was thus. Whenever I meditated praying, it was always before me, and nearer and nearer. It used to spring on a table, on the back of a chair, on the chimney-piece, and slowly to swing itself from side to side, looking at me all the time. There is in its motion an indefinable power to dissipate thought, and to contract one's attention to that monotony, till the ideas shrink, as it were, to a point, and at last to nothing, and unless I have started up and shaken off the catalepsy, I have felt as if my mind were on the point of losing itself. There are other ways, he sighed heavily. Thus, for instance, while I pray with my eyes closed, it comes closer and closer, and I see it. I know it is not to be accounted for physically, but I do actually see it, though my lids are closed, and so it rocks my mind, as it were, and overpowers me, and I am obliged to rise from my knees. If you had yourself ever known this, you would be acquainted with desperation. 9. THE THIRD STAGE I see, Dr. Hesselius, that you don't lose one word of my statement. I need not ask you to listen specifically to what I am now going to tell you. They talk of the optic nerves and of spectral illusions, as if the organ of sight was the only point assailable by the influences that have fastened upon me. I know better. For two years in my direful case that limitation prevailed. But as food is taken in softly at the lips and then brought under the teeth, as the tip of the little finger caught in a mill crank will draw in the hand and the arm and the whole body, so the miserable mortal who has been once caught firmly by the end of the finest fibre of his nerve is drawn in and in by the enormous machinery of hell until he is as I am. 
Yes, doctor, as I am, for while I talk to you and implore relief, I feel that my prayer is for the impossible, and my pleading with the inexorable. I endeavoured to calm his visibly increasing agitation, and told him that he must not despair. While we talked, the night had overtaken us. The filmy moonlight was wide over the scene which the window commanded, and I said, Perhaps you would prefer having candles. The light, you know, is odd. I should wish you as much as possible under your usual conditions while I make my uh, diagnosis, shall I call it. Otherwise I don't care. All lights are the same to me, he said, except when I read or write. I care not if night were perpetual. I am going to tell you what happened about a year ago. The thing began to speak to me. Speak? How do you mean? Speak as a man does, do you mean? Yes. Speak in words and consecutive sentences, with perfect coherence and articulation. But there is a peculiarity. It is not like the tone of a human voice. It is not by my ears it reaches me. It comes like a singing through my head. This faculty, the power of speaking to me, will be my undoing. It won't let me pray. It interrupts me with dreadful blasphemies. I dare not go on. I could not. Oh, doctor, can the skill and thought and prayers of man avail me nothing? You must promise me, my dear sir, not to trouble yourself with unnecessarily exciting thoughts. Confine yourself strictly to the narrative of facts, and recollect, above all, that even if the thing that infests you be, as you seem to suppose, a reality with an actual independent life and will, yet it can have no power to hurt you, unless it be given from above. Its access to your senses depends mainly upon your physical condition, that is, under God, your comfort and reliance. We are all alike environed. It is only that in your case, the parries, the veil of the flesh, the screen, is a little out of repair, and sights and sounds are transmitted. We must enter on a new course, sir. Be encouraged. I'll give tonight to the careful consideration of the whole case. You are very good, sir. You think it worth trying. You don't give me quite up. But, sir, you don't know. It is gaining such an influence over me. It orders me about. It is such a tyrant. And I'm growing so helpless. May God deliver me. It orders you about. Of course, you mean by speech. Yes, yes. It is always urging me to crimes, to injure others or myself. You see, doctor, the situation is urgent. It is indeed. When I was in Shropshire, a few weeks ago, Mr. Jennings was speaking rapidly and trembling now, holding my arm with one hand and looking in my face. I went out one day with a party of friends for a walk. My persecutor, I tell you, was with me at the time. I lagged behind the rest. The country near the Dee, you know, is beautiful. Our path happened to lie near a coal-mine, and at the verge of the wood is a perpendicular shaft, they say a hundred and fifty feet deep. My niece had remained behind with me. She knows, of course, nothing of the nature of my sufferings. She knew, however, that I had been ill, and was low, and she remains to prevent me being quite alone. As we loitered slowly on together, the brute that accompanied me was urging me to throw myself down the shaft. I tell you now, oh, sir, think of it, the one consideration that saved me from that hideous death was the fear lest the shock of witnessing the occurrence should be too much for the poor girl. I asked her to go on and take her walk with her friends, saying that I could go on no farther. She made excuses, and the more I urged her, the firmer she became. She looked doubtful and frightened. I suppose there was something in my looks or manner that alarmed her, but she would not go, and that literally saved me. You had no idea, sir, that a living man could be made so abject a slave of Satan, he said, with a ghastly groan and a shudder. There was a pause here, and I said, You are preserved, nevertheless. It was the act of God. You are in his hands, and in the power of no other being. Be therefore confident for the future. 10. Home I made him have candles lighted, and saw the room looking cheery and inhabited before I left him. I told him that he must regard his illness strictly as one dependent on physical, though subtle, physical causes. I told him that he had evidence of God's care and love in the deliverance which he had just described, and that I had perceived with pain that he seemed to regard its peculiar features as indicating that he had been delivered over to spiritual reprobation. Then such a conclusion nothing could be, I insisted, less warranted, and not only so, but more contrary to facts, as disclosed in his mysterious deliverance from that murderous influence during his Shropshire excursion. 
First, his niece had been retained by his side without his intending to keep her near him, and secondly, there had been infused into his mind an irresistible repugnance to execute the dreadful suggestion in her presence. As I reasoned this point with him, Mr. Jennings wept. He seemed comforted. One promise I exacted, which was that should the monkey at any time return, I should be sent for immediately, and repeating my assurance that I would give neither time nor thought to any other subject until I had thoroughly investigated his case, and that to-morrow he should hear the result, I took my leave. Before getting into the carriage, I told the servant that his master was far from well, and that he should make a point of frequently looking into his room. My own arrangements I made with a view to being quite secure from interruption. I merely called at my lodgings, and with a travelling desk and carpet-bag set off in a hackney carriage for an inn about two miles out of town called The Horns, a very quiet and comfortable house with good thick walls. And there I resolved, without the possibility of intrusion or distraction, to devote some hours of the night in my comfortable sitting-room to Mr. Jennings's case, and so much of the morning as it might require. There occurs here a careful note of Dr. Hesilius's opinion upon the case, and of the habits, diet, and medicines which he prescribed. It is curious, some persons would say mystical, but on the whole I doubt whether it would sufficiently interest a reader of the kind I am likely to meet with to warrant its being here reprinted. The whole letter was plainly written at the inn where he had hid himself for the occasion. The letter is dated from his town lodgings. I left town for the inn, where I slept last night at half-past nine, and did not arrive at my room in town until one o'clock this afternoon. I found a letter in Mr. Jennings' hand upon my table. It had not come by post, and on inquiry I learnt that Mr. Jennings' servant had brought it, and on learning that I was not to return until to-day, and that no one could tell him my address, he seemed very uncomfortable, and said that his orders from his master were that he was not to return without an answer. I opened the letter and read. Dear Dr. Hesilius, it is here. You had not been an hour gone when it returned. It is speaking. It knows all that has happened. It knows everything. It knows you, and is frantic and atrocious. It reviles. I send you this. It knows every word I have written. I write. This I promised, and I therefore write. But I fear very confusedly, very incoherently. I am so interrupted, disturbed. Ever yours, sincerely yours, Robert Linda Jennings. "'When did this come?' I asked. "'About eleven last night. "'The man was here again, and has been here three times to-day. "'The last time was about an hour since.' "'Thus answered, and with the notes I had made upon his case in my pocket, "'I was in a few minutes driving towards Richmond to see Mr. Jennings. "'I by no means, as you perceive, despaired of Mr. Jennings' case. "'He had himself remembered and applied, though quite in a mistaken way, "'the principle which I lay down in my metaphysical medicine,' and which governs all such cases. I was about to apply it in earnest. I was profoundly interested, and very anxious to see and examine him while the enemy was actually present. I drove up to the sombre house, and ran up the steps and knocked. The door in a little time was opened by a tall woman in black silk. She looked ill, and as if she had been crying. She curtsied and heard my question, but she did not answer. She turned her face away, extending her hand towards two men who were coming downstairs, and thus having, as it were, tacitly made me over to them, she passed through a side door hastily, and shut it. The man who was nearest the hall I at once accosted, but being now close to him I was shocked to see that both his hands were covered with blood. I drew back a little, and the man passing downstairs merely said in a low tone, "'Here's the servant, sir.' The servant had stopped on the stairs, confounded and dumb at seeing me. He was rubbing his hands in a handkerchief, and it was steeped in blood. "'Jones, what is it? What has happened?' I asked, while a sickening suspicion overpowered me. The man asked me to come up to the lobby. I was beside him in a moment, and frowning and pallid with contracted eyes, he told me the horror which I already half-guessed. His master had made away with himself— I went upstairs with him to the room. What I saw there, I won't tell you. He had cut his throat with his razor. It was a frightful gash. The two men had laid him on the bed and composed his limbs. It had happened, as the immense pool of blood on the floor declared, at some distance between the bed and the window. 
there was carpet round his bed, and a carpet under his dressing-table, but none on the rest of the room, for the man said he did not like a carpet in his bedroom. In this sombre and now terrible room, one of the great elms that darkened the house was slowly moving the shadow of one of its great bowers upon this dreadful floor. I beckoned to the servant, and we went downstairs together. I turned off the hall into an old-fashioned panelled room, and standing there I heard all the servant had to tell. It was not a great deal. I concluded, sir, from your words and looks, sir, as you left last night, that you thought my master seriously ill. I thought it might be that you were afraid of a fit or something, so I tended very close to your directions. He sat up late till past three o'clock. He was not writing or reading. He was talking a great deal to himself, but that was nothing unusual. About half the hour I assisted him to undress, and left him in his slippers and dressing gown. I went back softly in about half an hour. He was in his bed, quite undressed, and a pair of candles lighted on the table beside his bed. He was leaning on his elbow, and looking out at the other side of the bed when I came in. I asked him if he wanted anything, and he said no. I don't know whether it was what you said to me, sir, or something a little unusual about him, but I was uneasy, uncommon uneasy about him last night. In another half hour, or it might have been a little more, I went up again. I did not hear him talking as before. I opened the door a little. The candles were both out, which was not usual. I had a bedroom candle, and I let the light in, a little bit, looking softly round. I saw him sitting in that chair beside the dressing-table, with his clothes on again. He turned round and looked at me. I thought it was strange he should get up and dress, and put out the candles to sit in the dark that way. But I only asked him again if I could do anything for him. He said, No. Rather sharp, I thought. I asked if I might light the candles, and he said, Do as you like, Jones. So I lighted them, and I lingered about the room, and he said, "'Tell me the truth, Jones. Why did you come again? Did you not hear anyone cursing?' "'No, sir,' I said, wondering what he could mean. "'No,' said he after me. "'Of course, no.' And I said to him, "'Wouldn't it be well, sir, if you went to bed? It's just five o'clock.' And he said nothing but, "'Very likely. Good night, Jones.' So I went, sir, but in less than an hour I came again. The door was fast, and he heard me, and called, as I thought, from the bed, to know what I wanted, and you desired me not to disturb him again. I lay down and slept for a little. It must have been between six and seven when I went up again. The door was still fast, and he made no answer, so I did not like to disturb him, and thinking he was asleep, I left him till nine. It was his custom to ring when he wished me to come, and I had no particular hour for calling him. I tapped very gently, and getting no answer, I stayed away a good while, supposing he was getting some rest then. It was not till eleven o'clock I grew really uncomfortable about him, for at the latest he was never, that I could remember, later than half-past ten. I got no answer. I knocked and called, but still no answer. So not being able to force the door, I called Thomas from the stables, and together we forced it, and found him in the shocking way you saw. Jones had no more to tell. Poor Mr. Jennings was very gentle, and very kind. All his people were fond of him. I could see that the servant was very much moved. So, dejected and agitated, I passed from that terrible house, and its dark canopy of elms, and I hope I shall never see it more. While I write to you, I feel like a man who has but half waked from a frightful and monotonous dream. My memory rejects the picture with incredulity and horror. Yet I know it is true. It is the story of the process of a poison. A poison which excites the reciprocal action of spirit and nerve, and paralyzes the tissue that separates these cognate functions of the senses, the external and the interior. Thus we find strange bedfellows, and the mortal and immortal prematurely make acquaintance. Conclusion A Word for Those Who Suffer My dear Van Loo, you have suffered from an affliction similar to that which I have just described. You twice complained of a return of it. Who under God cured you? Your humble servant, Martin Hesselius? Let me rather adopt the more emphasized piety of a certain good old French surgeon of three hundred years ago. I treated, and God cured you. Come, my friend, you are not to be hippish. Let me tell you a fact. I have met with, and treated, as my book shows, fifty-seven cases of this kind of vision, which I term indifferently sublimated, precocious, 
and interior. There is another class of afflictions which are truly termed, though commonly confounded with those which I describe, spectral illusions. These latter I look upon as being no less simply curable than a cold in the head or a trifling dyspepsia. It is those which rank in the first category that test our promptitude of thought. Fifty-seven such cases have I encountered, neither more nor less. And in how many of these have I failed? In no one single instance. There is no one affliction of mortality more easily and certainly reducible with a little patience and a rational confidence in the physician. With these simple conditions, I look upon the cure as absolutely certain. You are to remember that I had not even commenced to treat Mr. Jennings's case. I have not any doubt that I should have cured him perfectly in eighteen months, or possibly it might have extended to two years. Some cases are very rapidly curable, others extremely tedious. Every intelligent physician who will give thought and diligence to the task will effect a cure. You know my tract on the cardinal functions of the brain. I there, by the evidence of innumerable facts, prove, as I think, the high probability of a circulation, arterial and venous in its mechanism, through the nerves. Of this system, thus considered, the brain is the heart. The fluid, which is propagated hence through one class of nerves, returns in an altered state through another, and the nature of that fluid is spiritual, though not immaterial, any more than, as I before remarked, light or electricity or so. By various abuses, among which the habitual use of such agents as green tea is one, this fluid may be affected as to its quality, but it is more frequently disturbed as to equilibrium. This fluid, being that which we have in common with spirits, a congestion found upon the masses of brain or nerve connected with the interior sense, forms a surface unduly exposed, on which disembodied spirits may operate communication, is thus more or less effectually established. Between this brain circulation and the heart circulation, there is an intimate sympathy. The seat, or rather the instrument, of exterior vision is the eye. The seat of interior vision is the nervous tissue and brain, immediately about and above the eyebrow. You remember how effectually I dissipated your pictures by the simple application of iced eau de cologne. Few cases, however, can be treated exactly alike, with anything like rapid success. Cold acts powerfully as a repellent of the nervous fluid. Long enough continued, it will even produce that permanent insensibility which we call numbness, and a little longer, muscular as well as sensational paralysis. I have not, I repeat, the slightest doubt that I should have first dimmed and ultimately sealed that inner eye which Mr. Jennings had inadvertently opened. The same senses are opened in delirium tremens, and entirely shut up again when the overaction of the cerebral heart, and the prodigious nervous congestions that attend it, are terminated by a decided change in the state of the body. It is by acting steadily upon the body by a simple process that this result is produced, and inevitably produced. I have never yet failed. Poor Mr. Jennings made away with himself. But that catastrophe was the result of a totally different malady, which, as it were, projected itself upon that disease which was established. His case was in the distinctive manner a complication, and the complaint under which he really succumbed was hereditary suicidal mania. Poor Mr. Jennings I cannot call a patient of mine, for I had not even begun to treat his case. And he had not yet given me, I am convinced, his full and unreserved confidence. If the patient does not array himself on the side of the disease, his cure is certain. The End of Green Tea by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu.